We spent a lot of very good time in the Wade Deep archives today, looking for the tape that we showed at the top of the show about the last time Republicans picked a member of the House for their vice presidential nominee. That was the Barry Goldwater campaign back in 64. And while we were rooting around in all that archive tape, we had a little bit of a eureka moment when we got to the part of the archives about tax returns. I've never seen this before today, but I think this is amazing. All right, it's 1974. Richard Nixon has just resigned. Gerald Ford has therefore just become president. And by the power vested in him by the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, Gerald Ford gets to pick who the new vice president of the United States will be. But because there is not an election that confirms his pick, this is just somebody being appointed by the guy who's just been named president, actually Congress has to confirm the choice. Congress has to confirm the guy Gerald Ford picks to be the new vice president. Who does he pick? He picks Michael Bloomberg. He picks the Michael Bloomberg of his time. He picks a governor who is a giantly, giantly rich New Yorker. But Nelson Rockefeller has to go before the Senate to be confirmed as VP. And Nelson Rockefeller will not release his tax returns. At least he tries not to. Watch him try not to with members of the press. The context here is that he's saying he will release his tax returns if the Senate demands that he has to. But he's not going to give his tax returns out to some pesky reporters. The role of a vice president totally depends on the president. If the president wants to use him, wonderful. If he doesn't, fine. Do you believe that he will do about your, what will you do about your financial assets to meet the uh, requirements of the uh, vice presidency? I'll just uh, conform to the law. Well, Governor, are you prepared to uh, detail uh, your personal finances for Congress, including your uh, tax returns? Make I'm prepared to do whatever the uh, Congress asks me and to conform to the law in every respect. What is your net worth now, Governor? You're not a member of the Congress. Excuse me. You just lauded, lauded the President's yes, openness. Yes. Uh, you seem to be uh, a little less than open with us. Could you? Well, you're not the committee of Congress. I'm, I haven't been confirmed, and I haven't gone before the committee. And my understanding understanding is that protocol says that you don't discuss matters that are going to be taken up by a committee before you get to the hearings. You doubt that you will be confirmed? Pardon me? You doubt that you will be confirmed? Well, I would never take anything for granted in life, Governor? particularly action uh, of this kind. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> I may see you again. <laughs> Eventually, Nelson Rockefeller did get confirmed by the Senate, but not before coughing up seven years of tax returns. Precedent matters, right? I mean, politically, right now, the most important thing about Mitt Romney not releasing his tax returns is that he hasn't been able to change the subject from people asking him to release his tax returns. But, but substantively, there's two things that I think are underappreciated and very relevant to this whole discussion. One of them is precedent. The other, of course, is what light his tax returns would shed on his plant how much money he would make under the policies he's proposing for the country, what his policies would do for his own tax burden and for the taxes paid by the middle class. On the issue of precedent, though, again, I think the national press, it, for some reason, is just blind to looking back at Mitt Romney's public record. I don't really understand it, but it seems that there's a willful resistance to looking back at what Mitt Romney has done in public life in the past. When Jim Messina from the Obama campaign today tried to make a deal with the Romney campaign about the tax returns, the Obama campaign narrowed the question. They asked for five years of returns. They asked Mr. Romney to, Romney to release from 2007 to 2012, basically the years Mr. Romney has been running for president. In doing that, they tried to address the Romney campaign's main objection to releasing more tax returns. They keep saying they're worried that if they reveal anything, the Obama campaign will only demand that they release more. Well, today, the Obama campaign manager acknowledged, acknowledged that concern. He said, quote, if the governor will release five years of returns, I commit in turn that we will not criticize him for not releasing more, neither in ads nor in other public communications or commentary for the rest of the campaign. Despite the question being narrowed and their objection being met, the Romney campaign still said no, no deal. Mr. Romney said he had looked back over the last decade of his returns and found that he, quote, never paid less than 13%. And we all have to trust him on that. But back when he was running for governor in Massachusetts in 2002, Mr. Romney set a precedent for what he is doing now. And it is a bad precedent. He was refusing to release his tax returns. He was insisting and said, you just have to trust me. That year in 2002, he just finished running the Olympics in Utah. He came back to Massachusetts and announced that he was making a bid for office because he had been in Utah, working in Utah for a few years. He had told a local Utah reporter that he had declared himself a Utah resident for tax purposes. 
So the public and the press, and certainly Massachusetts Democrats, wanted to see his tax returns. They wanted to know whether he was qualified to run for governor of Massachusetts, whether he'd met the requirement that you have to be a resident of the state for seven years. Mr. Romney declined to release his tax returns, citing a concern for privacy. Now, because the question was not Mr. Romney's income at the time, but it was his residency, the Boston Globe narrowed the question just exactly the way the Obama campaign did today. They offered the Romney campaign in 2002 a deal. The Globe said, release the tax returns to us with all of the financial information redacted, with all of the numbers blacked out, with only your name and address still visible. They narrowed the question to account for the supposed objections that Mr. Romney had raised to it. The issue is your residency. Just let us see the tax returns just to see your residency. But still, the Romney campaign said no. They said no deal. Mr. Romney had been filing as a Massachusetts resident, the campaign said. Mr. Romney's staffer, Eric Fernstrom, told the paper, you are going to have to take my word for it. And it turns out that word was not good. Facing a legal challenge by the Democrats, Mr. Romney was forced to admit that actually maybe the reason he didn't want to release those returns is because what was in them is not what he said was in them. He had not been filing his taxes as a Massachusetts resident, as he publicly insisted that he had. After he announced his campaign for governor, he had to go back and retroactively amend his taxes so that they would match what he had been saying they said. What the Romney campaign had been saying about his taxes when they said the public should just trust him was not true. They had been lying about what was in those tax returns. That's why they would not release them, even with all the financial details blacked out. But now they are assuring us that they never paid zero in taxes. And even with their stated objections for why they won't release the tax returns addressed in this new offer from the Obama campaign, even then, with the question narrowed, they still will not show the evidence. They are still saying, just trust us. The precedent for trusting them on this is not good. Stay with us. More ahead.